Chapter Eleven of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. Among the people who had been moved and stirred by the knowledge of Damien's work, and then the news of his illness, was one Joseph Dutton. This man had been born in Stowe, Vermont, and christened Ira Barnes Dutton. When he was four, his family had moved to Wisconsin, where he had been reared a devout Episcopalian. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he enlisted in a volunteer company serving in the army until 1866. He was mustered out with the rank of first lieutenant. For the next 14 years he lived in the South, a government employee in civil service. Handsome, engaging in manner, he had been something of a social lion in the small town where he was stationed, although he was known to be a heavy drinker. Suddenly he was missing from the parties and balls in which he used to be the center of gaiety. His absence caused discussion and bewilderment, then the explanation leaked out. He had become a Catholic and was living in the Trappist Monastery in Kentucky, not yet as a member of the order, but as a man trying to find himself. After about two years, he realized that he had no vocation for the contemplative life and left the monastery. It was a little later, while he was in New Orleans, visiting at the Redemptorist house there, that he first heard of Father Damien. Joseph, the name given to Dutton in Catholic baptism, was in the library looking through an old Catholic newspaper. In it he found an item about Malachi and Damien. Though he had never heard of either name before, and though the story was brief, Dutton realized as he read it that it indicated to him where his real vocation lay. He knew that he must get to Malachi as soon as possible, and when he got there, must offer himself for any work that he could do. On July 22, 1886, he arrived in Honolulu, and went at once to inform the bishop of his plan. Bishop Cookman, who had succeeded Bishop Magritte, was delighted, but could not, of course, give him permission to go to the leper settlement. Mr. Gibson, president of the Board of Health, received him cordially, and the permission was soon granted. Dutton was offered a small salary, but refused it. He wanted to make a gift of his life. On July 29th, Father Damien drove to the shore to meet the incoming boat. There stepped ashore a man in his early forties, dressed in a blue denim suit. It was to be his habitual dress until the end of his life. Dutton introduced himself, and the two voluntary exiles looked at each other. Father Damien saw an impressive figure, tall, well-knit, vigorous, carrying himself like a soldier. The newcomer's eyes were gray and looked straight and keen at the priest, and his smile was warm. Dutton saw a man not much older than himself, a man whose body had once been as vigorous as his own, but was now beginning to be eaten away. With joy, Damien welcomed him. They got into the carriage together, and as they drove off, Damien was already telling Dutton of his plans for the settlement. He wanted new buildings for the sick, a new and larger church, a convent where teaching and nursing sisters could live, a residence for priests and brothers. And we will call you the first of the brothers, Damien added. Brother Joseph. About the buildings, Brother Joseph began. I will be the carpenter, the man who does the heavy labor, interrupted Damien with a smile. You will be the skilled worker, the one who brings all the delicate work to perfection. I hope there will be enough work to keep me busy, Brother Joseph observed doubtfully. My training, my life so far, has not prepared me for much that will be of value here, I am afraid. You will learn, said Damien seriously, and you bring with you what could not be learned, what must come from within you, love and compassion. At half-past four the next morning, Brother Joseph started his first full day at Kalawao. And a full day it was, such as he had never known before. Until ten that night he never wasted a moment. He bathed the sick and dressed their sores. He finished building some coffins that the priest had started. He helped in the gardens. And above all, he talked with Father Damien, learning details of his plans, figuring ways in which they could be executed. The following day was the same and the day after. He found a special outlet for his abilities in the home for boys. He knew a little about bookkeeping and was able to bring order into the accounts. He planned work and recreation and introduced a healthy routine into the boys' lives. His army training enabled him to exercise a firm but kind discipline. Damien and Dutton made an excellent team, the Flemish peasant and the American ex-soldier. In their very differences, they complemented and stimulated each other. The priest, outspoken, obstinate at times, uninterested in his dress. Dutton, calm, reasonable, extremely neat, 
and devoted to Damien. Can't you take things a little easier, father, he would ask. Why not take a rest for a while, and... Rest, rest, Damien would cry. How can I rest? There is so little time and so much left to be done. So he continued his incredible labors. Dutton was always at his side, doing as much of the manual and mental work as he could. This left Damien a little more time for the spiritual help which he so loved to give, and the hours of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, which from boyhood had been his dearest joy. As each project was finished, Father Damien had a dozen more planned. A community kitchen was built, an establishment was constructed for medicated baths such as he had received in Honolulu. Additions were made to the children's home, and when storms took off part of the roof of Damien's house, he himself replaced it. Brother Joseph gave himself wholly to Malachi. Nevertheless, his recollections of life in the army and his love for America remained an important part of his life till the end. Each year the G.A.R. sent him a silk flag, which was raised daily on a tall pole he had erected on Malachi. Even when he was sick, even when he grew very old, he would not dedicate this much-loved task to anyone else. In 1908, there was great excitement in the settlement. Brother Joseph and all the lepers who could travel or be transported were at the shore. President Theodore Roosevelt had ordered that the Atlantic fleet, then on the round-the-world cruise, was to sail in line past the island of Molokai as a salute to the former army officer and his devotion to the lepers. When the First World War broke out, Brother Joseph offered his services as a veteran soldier. The offer could not be accepted, for he was then 76 years old. But from friends and benefactors all over the world, he had more than 4,000 correspondents before he died. He collected $9,000 for the war effort. And in 1925, the battle fleet once more sailed in review before Kalawao, while the octogenarian Dutton stood proudly beneath his flagpole. Each vessel in passing dipped its colors in salute to the brother of the world. Father Damien was failing rapidly. Each hand was now a single sore. His nose was so collapsed that it no longer functioned as an organ, and he was obliged to breathe entirely through his mouth. The sight of one eye was gone, and that of the other weakening daily. But the inexhaustible drive was still there. His mind still planned, and... Somehow, his disintegrating body found strength to carry out the plans. He was now receiving help from many quarters of the world. An Anglican minister in England, the Reverend U. B. Chapman, read of Damien's heroic work and wrote him, I wish I might offer you my personal services, but it is the will of God, I believe, that I remain with the poor here to assist them. Mr. Chapman did, however, raise several large sums of money, and what was equally important wrote letters to the London papers, which aroused interest in the work being done by the priest on Malachi. The interest took form in practical gifts for the lepers. Father Damien and Brother Joseph were encouraged, but they did not slow up in their work. Brother Joseph always woke before daylight to the scream of seabirds. The wind blew in briskly off the water, and waves made crashing music on the rocky shore. Rocks clattered down from the cliffs, displaced by the little wild goats that lived there but Dutton had little time to notice or enjoy these things. There was always work, and more work, awaiting his attention. For years, Father Damien had been physician for the souls and bodies of hundreds of lepers, had been priest, consoler, teacher, carpenter, painter, housekeeper, grave digger. The authorities in Hawaii were by no means wholly undeserving of credit. From time to time they had sent supplies, appropriated money for the leprosarium, appointed doctors to work there, but it was hard to understand, when you were far away, just how much help the sick people must have, and no doctor thus far had felt called on to sacrifice his whole life to them. It needed a truly dedicated man, one ready to die, if necessary, for suffering humanity, one ready to live as Damien did. The dirty huts which had sheltered, more or less, the inhabitants on Damien's arrival were now replaced by rows of whitewashed cottages. The lepers were somewhat better fed and cared for, but there was still much to be done, and Brother Joseph determined to do as much of it as he could. Each day he made it a point to finish a substantial amount of work before morning mass. Joseph suffered as he watched the good Damien, big, no longer, walk painfully to the altar. It was most difficult for the priest to kneel now, and when he bent low over the altar, 
Brother Joseph sometimes caught his breath and wondered if the head and shoulders would ever rise again. One morning in 1888, Father Damien went as usual to the shore to meet the incoming lepers. Now too feeble to walk, he rode in a ramshackle old wagon. It was years since the episode of the fine new carriage. Besides the duty of meeting his new parishioners, there was pleasure for him in the little trip. On this occasion he was thinking of distant days. He remembered very vividly all the details of the long voyage from Belgium. He remembered all he had learned about seamanship from Captain Gherkin and his crew. From years of observing the ships which passed the island, as well as those which put in there, he had come to know one from the other. He recognized the differences in the structure of the various vessels, and greeted them with the simple pleasure experienced in greeting old friends. There was always the possibility, too, that the ship might bring letters from home. As he waited in his usual perch on the rocks, he squinted against the sun. It was very painful to his eyes. The water this day was choppy under an offshore wind, and the crew of the ship had some difficulty in loading the lepers into the longboat and getting them ashore. But finally that task was done. Then the crew stowed a quantity of crates and boxes in the boat, and a man, obviously in good physical trim, jumped briskly aboard. Father Damien was puzzled. He peered intently, trying to see who the visitor might be, and when the man came ashore, stood up to greet him. "'I am Edward Clifford, Father Damien,' said the stranger. "'I read about you last year in England, my home, and determined to come and see you in your work.' "'You are welcome, Edward,' the priest smiled. "'You will stay with my good friend, Mr. Meyer?' "'I believe so, Father, but if I may, I want to call on you often.' "'These boxes and packages, they are yours.' Damien asked. They are yours, father, the new arrival told him, gifts from people in England. Some time previously, shortly after Joseph Dutton had come to help, a man named James Sinnott, who possessed some nursing experience, had asked the Board of Health to assign him to work on Molokai. Father Damien had at once named him Brother James. Then, in May 1888, another volunteer had come, a priest whose arrival delighted Damien's soul. Added to the spiritual satisfaction of having a fellow priest at hand, there was a human joy in the fact that the newcomer, Father Conradi, had been born and reared in Belgium. So now there were two priests and two brothers gathered at Damien's house to inspect the contents of Clifford's boxes. First came a gift from Lady Mount Temple, a handsome engraving of The Good Shepherd. The four men were excited enough about that, but they almost lost their power of speech when the next crate was opened. The Honorable Maud Stanley has sent fourteen fine, large pictures of the Stations of the Cross. Are these ladies Catholics? Father Damien asked. No, smiled Clifford. They are not. Not Catholics, and so good to my little Catholic church. Father Damien had grateful tears in his eyes. The next package, from Lady Caroline Charteris, held a music box. Now, by simply turning the handle, the lepers would be able to play about forty different tunes. We must show the boys how to use this. Delightedly, Father Damien beamed on Brother Joseph. They will get so much joy out of it. Then, out of the seemingly inexhaustible treasure trove, came a magic lantern with a collection of colored slides, then several gifts of money to be spent as Damien saw the need. Last of all, and with great care, Clifford unpacked a painting, The Vision of St. Francis. The artist, Mr. Byrne Jones, painted it for you, he told the priest. Is it very valuable? asked Brother Joseph, noting the care with which Clifford had handled it. It is by a celebrated painter, and I should imagine worth several hundred dollars, answered Clifford. Wordlessly, the other four looked at one another. On his way from England, Clifford had stopped off in India to get some gurgent oil. It was used there, reportedly, with some success in arresting leprosy. The kind man had brought a case of it to Father Damien. The priest had no faith in the oil. But rather than run the risk of hurting this generous friend, he anointed his afflicted body with it. See, I can sing now, he later said to his guests, and I haven't sung in many months. Croakingly, painfully, for his lungs were affected, he forced himself through a simple hymn. I haven't been able to do that in a long time, not until you brought the oil. That evening, when the lepers gathered for their usual visit with their beloved Camiano, they wanted, of course, to meet the visitor. They were eager to ask if he had brought any news from Honolulu. 
the home city of many of them. They hoped he would have some report to give about the great world, which, so far, many others knew only through Father Damien's stories. They told of the happenings of their day, recounted jokes on each other, and basked in the happy, kindly atmosphere that invariably surrounded Damien. Then, as darkness fell, Clifford and the brothers were busy about some preparations of their own. Suddenly, on the whitewashed wall, there blossomed out a picture of one of the very cities of which Damien had told them. It was truly a magic evening, made so by the slides of the magic lantern. Scenes from Bible stories, from parables, pictures of faraway places were projected. The generosity of an unknown friend had brought untold pleasure to the lepers. End of chapter 11 Recording by Maria Therese